-hmm. But there is the one last motive, and it's the most disturbing because it's also the one that I've encountered far too often, which is that there are those who, in in their heart of hearts, there, there, there lurks that little barbarian that's in all of us who demands that he or she uh, be recognized as the winner mm. uh, and uh, who requires in order to feel especially loved by God or especially triumphant in the game of life will require if necessary billions of souls writhing in agony for all eternity mm-hmm. to certify him or her in that special status mm-hmm. and uh, I'd like to say that that's for those who really are committed to the idea of hell, again, remember, my contention is that the majority of Christians actually don't believe it nearly as much as they think they do. Yeah. But for those who are really, really passionately committed to it, and there are some, again and again, yeah. I have encountered that sort of strange pathology, that need to mm-hmm. be in the little gated community. And there's no point of being in the little gated community if you do, if there aren't legions of people outside the gates envying you. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, that which which is frightening this, you know, this idea that we sort of need well, I think uh, we're, we're okay of them to know we? that we're not absolutely, absolutely. I mean, for we, those people we all want to be winners. Therefore, and and to be winners, it, it helps for there to be uh losers, so we want them to lose absolutely. I mean, I want the Orioles to win the the World Series every year, but <laughs> hasn't sure. happened since '83. But I mean, that means that I want I want to leave twenty I want to leave uh, twenty nine other cities without a championship forever. You know, right. uh, if I if I really were to pursue that to the end, and that seems a rather selfish motive, but it's it's right. generated out of a sincere desire for something that to me is an inherent good of being. That is the Orioles. Mm. Yes. And I appreciate the fact that, like, even to yourself, like, you recognize the, the, something human in that. And yet part of what I found so liberating about the book is that you do label that ultimately as a pathology when it's played all the way out theologically. And that seems so important to say. And it's and it's refreshing to hear someone say it that way. Well, uh, if I have any virtue that I, uh, I, I, as a writer, it is, um, you know, I, I'm not coy, uh, so... Right. Right. Um, but I mean, I think you, you'll you see as the book is out a bit, I mean, you're going to see just how violent the reactions of some people will be against it. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you, it's not like other books I've, I've written where, you know, the new atheists didn't like me putting out books uh, explaining at length philosophically mm-hmm. why why their attacks on theism were failures you know but you know so you got the sort of uh, 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 vicious or sarcastic reviews from people who weren't very good philosophers like Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne this will be different this will be different mm-hmm. in fact I've already seen it uh, my, my former uh, I used to write for first things until I became uh, distressed by the political uh directions taken by its editors I, i'm yeah. you know politically i'm not a right-wing person or well or in american terms i'm not a liberal either but anyway putting yeah. politics aside but i i had i used you know but but the the current uh state of things made it impossible for me to remain but they commissioned uh, uh, a review by a guy named doug farrow whom i've known for 20 years and i know him to be well let's just say excitable by nature mm. um, and deeply committed to people going to hell. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, uh, and his review is, was very instructive to me. It was, it was ferocious. It was truculent, but it, not at mm. one point at not, at not a single point did it accurately describe my argument. In fact, uh, I don't think Doug's so dumb that he believed what he was saying, but he mm. basically attributed to me like 12 or 14 arguments that that are not the ones I made and then attacked them. Now, what would lead a person to do that? Well, mm. it's not just that he wants to be, you know, it's not just even if there were some personal hatred for me. It's mm. not that. It's that he desperately needs that, that he needs hell to be eternal. And any book that comes along that challenges that, if he can't 
if he can't defeat the arguments he finds there, which he clearly couldn't if he understood them, and I'm assuming he must have understood some of them, then to get people not to read it, he's willing to lie about it. Mm. And, and very angrily in a tone that, that, that almost came across as deranged. Now, why does a person do that? Well, mm. at some level, he had some emotional commitment to this. And I think, I, I don't, I can't plumb his soul, but what is that commitment? Well, it's the one that all of us at one time or another could feel. Yeah. I'm not special if everyone is special, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there's the sense mm-hmm. that in our limited human way, we just can't understand that grace is more gracious the more abundantly it's given. Mm. It has to, for us to believe, it has to be parsimonious. It has to be stingy. It has, it has to be grudgingly given. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we have harder hearts. <laughs> yeah. And yet if we think about it, I mean, I've, I've used this image before, but let me try it out on you in case you haven't heard it. So <laughs> it'll seem yeah. novel. I mean, you know, it's just to put it in simple terms. A, um, You know, it's, it's 1840 and somewhere uh, in a little village in Suffolk. The local squire decides to put on a fete for all the children in the village. And he invites them onto his estate. But the children of the better families he lets come inside, and he gives them presents, right? And uh, gives them the nice foods, the, the special trifle. Whereas the other children get to play outside in the garden, supervised, and are given a few kites to play with and some glasses of water. Mm. Okay, so no one's going to hell there, right? We, all there's, there's just been a discrimination made. Well, everyone's getting given something. All the children are getting something they wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm-hmm. But do, do we not, if we think about it, does that mean that the ones who got the better deal, do we think that the gift that was given to them was more precious and more gracious as a result of the weird uh, parsimony, the, the odd kind of prejudice that prevented the, the master, the, the Lord of the Manor, from giving it to all the children? Or would we find it more precious and believe it's more gracious and see it as more bountiful and unexpected and undeserved if it were given freely to all? Yes. You yes. know, even, you know, you know, and, and somehow we seem to, I've seen this argument made by another guy who's ferociously in favor of eternal hell named Michael McClyman, who wrote this 1400 page book last, it came out last year, really bad book in terms of scholarship, but that, that's not the issue. He just keeps insisting in this weirdly unreflective way that, mm. um, grace can't be grace unless it's, um, unless it's withheld from the majority of people. Mm. And uh, that just makes no sense to me. It just seems to be a childish, uh, selfish way of thinking and and one that we're all guilty of sometimes, but from which all of us, I think, should be set free by the example of a God who's willing to die for us. 